FSN Radio. It's all about what's next. Go to FinancialSurvivalNetwork.com and sign up for your free weekly newsletter. You'll also get three free reports. The Financial Survival Network. It's all about what's next. Welcome. You are listening to the Financial Survival Network. I'm Kerry Lutz. It is July 5th, 2017. Well, there was once a presidency, and correct me if I'm wrong, I believe it was Warren Emil Harding, and it was supposed to be a return to normalcy. Well, the economy going on right now, the world in which we live in, nothing is normal anymore. And, well, Jordan Goodman is with us now, moneyanswers.com. Hey, if you've got any questions, comments, email us at kl at kerrylutz.com. And Jordan, uh, hey, at least we're semi-normal on this show, right? I think we are. Maybe we're the only normal ones left, Kerry, <laughs> yes. I often think that that's the case, but then I'm wondering, is that a sign that you're not normal if you believe you're the only normal one? Is it <laughs> catch-22? Something like that. <laughs> no, it's a very unusual situation we have now because you've got the Fed Reserve raising short-term interest rates. They've raised them three times in the last six months, basically. They said they're going to raise them again this year, either September or December, and another three times next year, uh, and they're shrinking their balance sheet, at least they said they are by $600 billion or so over the next year. So in effect, the Fed's tightening um, and the economy is getting slower. I think that's that's quite clear. And and they're not doing it to slow the economy. They're doing it for so-called normalization purposes. Uh, but you're seeing the impact on that. I mean, people are paying more for credit cards, student loans, car loans, small business loans, all the things tied to the prime rate have been, in fact, going up. Um, and you're seeing the impact. You're seeing car sales have been down six months in a row. Uh, retail sales have been weaker. Even home sales have been slower. And to some extent, that's because of a lack of inventory. Uh, but mortgage rates, you know, they're still up there to some extent. So I just think it's very odd that the Fed is raising rates when, when the economy is already slowing. In this flattening of the yield curve, where the short-term rates are going up and the long-term rates are going down, is inevitably a bad, bad sign for the future economy, isn't it? When you get to an inverted yield curve, meaning short rates are higher than long term rates, that is a clear sign that a recession is coming. Now, we're not there yet, but we're going that direction. Uh, as you said, the Fed raising rates uh, with a, what they control, which is what's called the Fed funds rate, is now one and a quarter, which means the prime is four and a quarter. So that's definitely been going up. But long term rates, for the most part, have been coming down. The 10 year treasury had gotten up to about 2.6 in February. And lately, it's been about 2.1, 2.2, something in that range. Um, and that is telling you the bond market's telling you things are weakening. Uh, you wouldn't have long rates coming down that much if the economy was strengthening. So that's the flattening of the yield curve. So there's some positive negatives. The positive of that is it's brought down mortgage rates to their lowest levels in over nine months now. Uh, the 30-year fixed rate mortgage, which not that long ago was almost 5%, a little bit over 5 is now down to 4 sometimes even a little bit below 4 3.9 thereabouts. And the 15-year fixed, which not that long ago was over 4 is now bound to 3 maybe 2.9. So certainly for refinancing, uh, it makes sense. Again, if your current mortgage is 45 to 5% or higher, so it makes sense to take a look at refinancing. A website that can help you there is you can refi, Y-O-U-C-A-N-R-E-F-I.com. Um, and if you can switch from a 30-year to a 15-year at that lower rate, even though the payments may be a little bit higher, that would certainly be a good good move to make. Um, and I've, I've talked in your show before about the so-called mortgage optimization system or strategy where you can pay off a 30-year mortgage in about five or six years is uh, because you're using a home equity line of credit, which is tied at the lower rate, and you're making a lot more progress in your principal than you typically would. Uh, a website there, truthinequity.com. Uh, literally, you can pay off a 30-year mortgage about five or six years on your existing level of income if you have an open mind, I guess you might say. <laughs> yeah, well, you got to change your behavior to do that. You do. So, you do. yeah, well, the question is, do you pay off your mortgage or can you make more money uh, investing in something else that's not too off the wall, crazy risky. Right. So the, if you do something that's super conservative in the bank, it's not going to work because you're going to earn pretty much near zero. Uh, I mean, the, the bank is still paying, you know, pretty much zero or a little bit more than zero on CDs, savings accounts, money market funds. And I think that's going to stay that way, Kerry. I, I think the banks feel under no pressure whatsoever to raise what they're paying on deposits, even though they're very happy to raise what they're charging on loans. So their profit margin has widened. Um, and in fact, they just went through these stress tests. All top 34 banks 
passed with flying colors because they're making so much money. And as a result of that, the Fed said, raise your dividends and buy back stocks. So they were turning a huge amount of money to their shareholders. Uh, the dividends went up between 60 and 100% for the big banks, Citibank, mm -hmm. Wells Fargo, JP Morgan, things like that. And literally billions of dollars in stock buybacks that they were not able to do before. So the banks are doing really well and their shareholders are doing really well. Uh, but the poor depositors out there are, are suffering. Yeah. And, and, and people say, why aren't they raising what they're paying? Is well, they can get away with it. So they do is basically yeah. what's happening. And they're not, uh, they're not making loans to uh, needy businesses. So the idea of them buying back their stock is 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 madness and uh, and is harmful to the economy. I mean, it is. It's less capital to be lent. Yeah. I mean, here we are, eight nine years after the financial crisis, and it still have a very tight credit environment as far as I'm concerned, particularly on yeah. the small business loan side and the mortgage side. Even though rates are down for mortgages, the financial paperwork you have to go through to get a mortgage oh. and prove everything is just outrageous. It's, it's just ridiculous. It's maddening. Well, what this is going to lead to, and you know as well as I do, is increase in the size of the shadow banking system. Right. I mean, companies like SoFi and um, who is it? Uh, well, Prosper, Lending Club. There's Lending a whole Club. bunch of alternative of lenders out there. That's great. Well, this uh, is going to be a boon to them. Uh, yeah. Because even if they keep their rates the same, they're still making an unbelievable spread. You know, I've been reading a book uh, by Mervyn King, who is a former governor of the Bank of England. Mm -hmm. And, you know, they can all tell the truth after they leave. That's they can't right. tell the truth when they're there. They got to lie their behinds off. And, you know, he talks about the whole flawed nature of banking in our civilization now. And that is that they borrow short term and they, lo they loan long long term. And so you can borrow cheaper short term. That means taking deposits for 25 basis points. And then they loan them out in the mortgage market, which is still pretty safe. Uh, they love to do subprime auto loans, not sub sub right. and mortgages, which uh, have become much safer after the shakeout. In my opinion, it's probably the safest loan out there, barring another meltdown, which doesn't appear to be in the offing. So their whole thing is flawed because now that they can just get the money from the Fed or next to nothing and they could just keep borrowing from the Fed indefinitely and getting these spreads, I mean... They're just not going to help the productive economy. They're not going to make any loan that has any element of risk Correct. except for credit cards. You know, credit cards is a big... Uh is a big vulnerability Achilles That's heel huge for them. Profitable, hugely profitable. I mean, they're not charging 4% like for a mortgage. They're charging 14% or something like this. A much bigger room right. for losses and credit cards. And in general, de delinquency rates on credit cards are very, very low. So even those are doing uh, well right, also. Right now they're low. But if the economy tanks, if the yield curve is correct in what it's anticipating, the economy is going to hit a recession, then it's not to, unusual to see virtually all of a bank's profits wiped out by their by their uh, delinquencies. Yeah. Right. Exactly. I That's mean, correct. It happens so all on, the time. On the deposit, I just want to give a little hope on the depositor side because you don't have to sit, sit there like a lump earning nothing on your CDs and savings accounts and money market funds, which is what the banks are going to keep paying. Uh, I mean, I've mentioned before, it's been very helpful to your listeners. These commercial mortgage bridge loans is a way of earning 6% quite safely over one year. If you go out two years, you get 8%. If you go out three years, you can get 9%, something like that. Uh, there's a website for that, commercialmortgagebridgeloans.com. They're lending to the small businesses that we just said are having a hard time getting loans from traditional banks for commercial real estate projects or buying something or renovating or doing a deal of some kind over a short period of time. They, they, they take the money for a year. They're willing to pay a higher interest rate for a short period of time uh, because they know they're going to get a good return on it. So it's another example of kind of the shadow banking system coming through. Just because the bank says no doesn't mean people don't want to go ahead and do their projects. Hey. So this is a way of you profiting from that by earning 6% instead of sitting there earning nothing at the bank. Exactly. Hey, and one other thing, the banks don't really hold on to most of their loans anymore. They're intermediaries. They securitize and blow the things out the back door like mortgage mortgages that they make, uh, which get sold on the secondary and securitized uh, portfolios of credit card debt, of auto loans. auto loans. I mean, if there is a payment stream, it can be securitized. I'm sure they're doing it with rental properties. These large hedge funds are sure. securitizing Student loans. Them. Anything can Student be secured. Loans. Uh, the, the one area I'm concerned about is, as you said, auto loans, because yeah. there you've had a big increase in subprime and the delinquency rate has doubled there in the last year or so yeah. uh, because people took on much bigger car payments they could really afford. 
They rolled um, over. And dead. now they can yeah. get those cars back. They can repo them very quickly. They put these uh, defeat devices right. in the car. So if you haven't made your payment, you're driving along the highway and all of a sudden your car dies because you haven't made your yeah. payment and they know where to go and pick it up. Um, yeah. So that has emboldened the banks to make subprime auto loans in the past they probably would not have been able to make. Exactly. And the, the other thing with the subprime auto loans, now shadow banking systems pick that up. And I would call the, uh, the auto industries captive finance subsidiaries. Yep. I would call them part of the shadow banking system. So they've switched to leases and you know what's happening to uh, new the, newer used dying, car prices. Cars They're plummeting, tanking. Plummeting. Yeah. Tanking. Yeah. So this is going to be bad. Uh, and those have been securitized as well. We don't even know. That's the part of the problem, Jordan, is we don't even know everything that's been securitized. That was a large portion of, of the last financial collapse was securitization because with that comes derivatives and uh, CDOs. They couldn't even find where these mortgages came from because they've no. been sold so many times. No, they were split up, tranched. Tranched uh, and, and yeah. the subprime was mixed sliced in with prime and, diced, and so on. <laughs> sliced and diced, pureed and sauteed and you wound up with, with a, uh, a pancake that But when uh, the that default wasn't... started happening then they found out where it was from because the payments <laughs> yeah. weren't going through the system. And that's what led to the downfall of Bear Stearns and Lehman right. Brothers, mm -hmm. uh, basically in, in 2008, and ultimately AIG, which was backing yeah. all this stuff as well. And they oh, had to be yeah. bailed out. That's where it, that was the backstop for all of it, and the backstop fails. Right, basically. and we've learned nothing from it. They're securitizing everything but the kitchen sink. I came up with a concept of uh, uh, allowance securitization, where kids in school <laughs> say, hey, I'm going to get 20 bucks a week this year, 25 next and 30 so i can securitize it and get three four thousand dollars get the money and now right? we call these uh, parental payout uh, participation notes ppns <laughs> ppns and kids can securitize their allowance and then go out and have a party i mean it's great <laughs> i mean we've gotten that absurd here jordan and it it's is. gonna it it's going to blow up again yeah no, when the what's ha it blows up when the payments stop. Yeah, um, and uh, that's what's happening in the subprime auto business now. For example, exactly. Um, so far, mortgages is not not uh, there's not a lot of subprime mortgage loans, a smattering, but not, no, not no. that was pretty much cleaned out in 2008, 2009. <laughs> yeah, uh, but the areas and then I think credit cards eventually as well. Right now, they're relatively low delinquency rates, but that's an area of risk because a lot oh, of yes. people have credit cards that shouldn't be having them or are paying extremely high rates, and they default on those. Too eventually. So yeah. there's just a huge amount of debt built up in our system at the governmental level, at the corporate level, at the individual level. And just look around mm -hmm. the world. You, you think we have a lot of debt. Look at China. <laughs> okay. Oh, my God. Yeah. It's staggering the amount of debt they have there. I think China is the largest Ponzi scheme in human history, frankly. Yeah, well, they do make good crap, though. I'll have to <laughs> give them that. I mean, it's crap, but it's so cheap that you don't care if it wears out in a year. You just buy another one. Uh, yeah. yeah. So but I mean, words, it. I was over there, yeah. and, and they're, all this building of factories, oh, apartments, and so on, it's just massive overinvestment uh, there at 0% in many cases. And they lend from the Central Bank of China, mm -hmm. not because the project is needed, but because they want to create employment, basically. Yeah. And uh, and because uh, some crony is getting a kickback from uh, some, yep. you know, I mean, you talk about, well, they don't have capitalism, but they sure have crony capitalism. You know, they didn't bother with the first step. So they got crony <laughs> economics and it's definitely a case of who you know. And but a lot of people have gotten wealthy there. It's definitely well. That's what happens. I mean, Ponzi. You, you get a concentration like that. I mean, just to give you a sense of the numbers I saw recently, the total amount of debt in China was three trillion in 2006, mm -hmm. and now it's 36 trillion. Hey, well, what's a little debt among friends? And we're at 20 trillion. We're hitting our debt ceiling at 20 trillion. We have gone up dramatically more than, and continue to, because they keep these so-called zombie companies alive. Yeah, that should be killed off. Uh, yes. And aluminum and steel and coal and all kinds of things. There's a tremendous excess around the world. These are not should not be living, but they keep them going to keep people working because they're worried about social revolution, basically. Yeah. But this causes worldwide deflationary trends. Uh, you, you see it. There's, oh, yeah. And there's people complain about they're dumping steel or they're dumping aluminum. That's because they have all these factories they don't need to drink to produce stuff they don't need need to use there. Yeah, it's called malinvestment on a, the grandest scale in the history of humanity. And Jordan, we'd be remiss if we didn't uh, discuss Caracas, Illinois. Uh, <laughs> yes. You know, it's because well, they haven't a had a budget Republic. now in three years. 
Uh, just total, passed one. Just total, passed uh, one. Deadlock there. They uh, just passed one yesterday or the day before with a five billion dollar tax increase that will only bring in half of what they're thinking it's going to bring in. They drive people out to yeah. Wisconsin and to Indiana and Iowa, all around Florida, there. Florida and Texas and right. Tennessee and civilized states without uh, without state income taxes. This is what they call the death spiral. And I, I think their bonds, if they're not already there, are going to be junk bond status pretty soon. Um, and they've got an underfunded pension fund of yeah. hundreds of billions of dollars. I don't yeah, know what the latest number is. 217 billion. It's only 29% funded. That but, is outrageous. You know, <laughs> but this is the whole Western world is in the same boat. Underfunded yeah. pensions with no ability to ever make them solvent again. And uh, But it's always refreshing to know that Chris Christie can still go to the beach <laughs> and unwind <laughs> while uh, pandemonium is breaking. The only thing that's missing... <laughs> Maybe is, he could run for governor of Illinois. Yeah, the only thing that was <laughs> missing with Chris and his state hadn't passed a budget either, New Jersey. The only thing that was missing was that he didn't have his violin with him. <laughs> they did pass one in, in time for they open the speeches for the 4th of July, so that was nice oh, of them, phew. yes. I'm, I'm, and we have this coming up at the national yeah. level too. We're going to have a budget deficit, uh, I mean a budget crisis, and then national, raising the national debt ceiling, which people say maybe late August or you know, relatively soon we're going to go into that whole circus again. Um, and this time the Republicans are going to have to take the heat on raising the debt ceiling. Last time they gave, remember we almost closed down the government, defaulted mm -hmm. on national debt. Uh, they finally worked that one out, but it's it's all this drama that's just not needed uh, on the on the financial front. Never mind the political front. Yeah. So a couple of months ago, when we talked, when after Trump had been uh, miraculously elected uh, president here, you were very optimistic. You were definitely you definitely come down with a case of Trump phoria. Uh, well, that's been true in the stock market. It is, I mean, and deregulation has in fact happened. I think, and yeah. a lot of areas that has helped labor laws, environmental laws, FDA is approving drugs faster. I mean, there are definitely been some improvements, but it's all been uh, administratively or yeah. executive order uh, or through the agencies. Nothing has got through Congress whatsoever. And I, frankly, I do not think they're going to get through any kind of a health care bill. I just think I, it's, it's heavy lifts. I will take issue with you on that for the simple reason that the current uh, Obamacare regime is blowing up and people are really getting hurt by it. And, I agree. And the cost of inaction is going to become far more than the cost of action, whatever the action is. If they can just do something that will knock down the prices by 15%, they'll be hailed as heroes and they can kick the can down the road on the rest of the stuff and call it a day and come home to their constituents and pat themselves on the back. And the other thing that's going to happen, telling you it's going to happen, is tax reform. Okay, mm -hmm. It's going to occur. Now, I don't know how these things are going to happen. I don't think they're going to be pretty, but uh, you can't, even though Trump is an outsider, doesn't know anything, is stupid, he's a buffoon, a clown, etc. The clown has managed to turn the tables on the mainstream media in the past couple of weeks. Yes. Uh, CNN is like... Uh, is being held together with bailing wire, chewing gum, <laughs> and paper clips. You know, that thing is, they're the walking dead. Yes. And and who would have thought this? Like three, four months ago, you figured out uh, Trump was finished, they'll impeach him. And now the mainstream media is, is hemorrhaging. And I don't think there's any way to put Humpty Dumpty back together. So my yeah. point is... No, I agree. I, agree. I, I hope yeah. you're right on both the health care mm -hmm and taxes, because I think we need it in both cases. Uh, I just think that such political dysfunction in Washington on the healthcare one, I mean, they're talking about massive cuts in Medicaid, right. where you're talking about 20 to 25 million people being thrown off. Uh, uh, you know, that's, that's kind of unpopular. But it's, they're going to get thrown take entitlements off. away from people. They're going to get thrown off anyway, because when Obamacare blows up, you know, people just aren't going to take health insurance. And he's already said that he's not going to enforce the mandate. So, right. so those 25 people are going to lose their health insurance no matter what it's just here under uh, under trump care they have the the option of not having health care that's the difference yeah. but now, i mean a lot of the people that would be losing health care would be because of voluntarily yeah, saying exactly. i don't want to pay for it i'm not being forced to do it anymore and i'm going to willing to take that risk 
you about got 15 it. of the 20 million or so, it, it would be voluntary. People never talk about right. that part. Yeah, well, just like they never talk about the 20 million people who got covered under Obamacare, we're really covered under Obamacade. Uh, exactly. Yeah, exactly. They, they, it, was, it wasn't like, uh, it was like, hey, let's go check out our health insurance policy at United Healthcare. No, it's like, let's go down to the local welfare office and sign up for, for Obamacade. That's what this exactly. is about. Exactly. That's where all the growth was. That's correct. Yeah. So we'll see. I mean, I hope they get that done. And then taxes, I mean, in general, there's agreement on cutting the corporate rate, cutting, cutting the individual rates. Uh, but there's some very contentious things in the tax bill, too. For example, they're talking about lowering or eliminating the deduction for state and local income taxes, which is not going to make people happy in New York, California, Pennsylvania, all the, the high tax states. People in Florida and Texas will love it. Uh, but that's very, very controversial. So yeah. uh, we'll have to see if they can get that through politically as well. Well, hey, you know, they can always do phase outs. And that's the thing. The way they will address most of the sticky issues is kick the can down the road, phase it out. And then uh, later on, they'll try to repeal the phase out. But hey, you know, that's uh, that's the beauty of our system here. Of, but it's of been checks. amazing with all this uncertainty in Washington. Stock market has been doing great. And well, that, that's telling you that mm -hmm. corporate profits are going to be better. Uh, the deregulation is helping companies do things they couldn't do in the past. Animal spirits, as, as John Maynard Keynes <laughs> used to talk about, are, are rising. Yeah. So there is some reason for, for optimism, I would say. And, and it's very strange we have the stock market and the bond market giving options opposite signals. The stock market thing is getting better. Earnings are going up. The economy is getting better. The bond market with yields falling in general is saying things are getting worse and, and so on. So I don't know if they can both be right at the same time, but that's been going on for most of this year. There's the stock market's been optimistic and the bond market's been pessimistic. Yeah. Well, you know, we're in uncharted territory, so we just have to see what's going to happen. Anyway, uh, just on the uh, bridge loans again, can you just give that website? Sure. So it's commercialmortgagebridgeloans.com. So that's a way of getting a safe 6% over one year. Uh, if you want to go out to three years, you can get 9%. There's a whole bunch of different programs, and there's a little video explaining how it all works. So don't be a lump and keep your money in the bank earning nothing when you can earn 6 Absolutely. to 9% relatively hey, safely. Totally agree with you. Um, Jordan, uh, just one more thing. Uh, you know, you've got your ear to the ground. You watch the financial markets. What do you think? Uh, are we at a stock market peak yet? Or are no, we getting close to it? I don't think it? so. I do not, not, not in the U.S., no, because there's still a ton of money on the sidelines to come in. Um, earnings, I think, are going to keep, we had a very good earnings season for the first quarter. I think the second quarter is going to be good, too. In certain mm -hmm. sectors, uh, you know, biotechnology is doing well. General technology, you know, the Googles and Apples of the world are, are doing uh, very well, and the whole cloud is empowering books. people. Amazon is doing well. So there's areas that are really doing well. The leaders are, are gaining more market share. Amazon is kind of wiping out the rest of the retail industry. But if you're in Amazon, it's over $1,000 a share. You're feeling pretty good. you know. So uh, no, I, I do not think we're near a peak in the stock market now. Interest rates, though rising, are still at relatively low levels. Um, and around the world, we still look like the best place to invest with what's going on. We talked about the bubble in China. Uh, right. So I, I do not think we're at a peak in the stock market, no. Hey, and just one final thing. I don't know if you caught this uh, in the press recently, but the, the Central Bank of Switzerland just happens to own $80 billion worth of U.S. stocks. Yes. Uh, like, <laughs> why are all the central banks uh, becoming stock speculators? There's nothing left for them to buy. <laughs> in Japan, they'll buy, you know, paper clips or something. I mean, uh, in, in Switzerland, they get it literally a negative yield. I mean, I know. you're going to do very well in U.S. stocks. And if you're in Swiss commercial paper, it's minus 3% or something. Yeah, agreed. Okay, well, Jordan, that's it for now. But uh, find Jordan over at moneyanswers.com. Email us, kl at carrylutz.com. And take a look at financialsurvivalnetwork.com. Sign up for the free newsletter. Twitter feeds at Carrie Lutz. And the Facebook page is Financial Survival Network. Jordan, we will catch up with you later. Thanks so much, as always, for being on. Thanks so much, Carrie. And always glad to get emails from your listeners. I get them all the time. FSN Radio. It's all about what's next. Go to FinancialSurvivalNetwork.com and sign up for your free weekly newsletter. You'll also get three free reports. The Financial Survival Network. It's all about what's next. Barring another meltdown, which doesn't appear to be in the offing. So their whole thing is flawed because now that they can just get the money from the Fed for next to nothing, and they could just keep borrowing from the Fed indefinitely and getting these spreads, I mean, 
they're just not going to help the productive economy. They're not going to make any loan that has any element of risk Correct. except for credit cards. You know, credit cards is a big uh, is a big vulnerability, Achilles That's heel huge for them. Profitable, hugely profitable. I mean, they're not charging 4% like for a mortgage. They're charging 14% or something like that. There's a much bigger room right. for losses and credit cards. And in general, de delinquency rates on credit cards are very, very low. So even those are doing uh, well right, also. Right now they're low. But with the economy tanks, if the yield curve is correct in what it's anticipating, the economy is going to hit a recession, then it's not to, unusual to see virtually all of a bank's profits wiped out by their by their uh, delinquencies. Yeah. Right. Exactly. I That's mean, correct. It happens so all on, the time. On the deposit, I just want to give a little hope on the depositor side because you don't have to sit, sit there like a lump earning nothing on your CDs and savings accounts and money market funds, which is what the banks are going to keep paying. Uh, I mean, I've mentioned before, it's been very helpful to your listeners. These commercial mortgage bridge loans is a way of earning 6% quite safely over one year. If you go out two years, you get 8%. If you go out three years, you can get 9%, something like that. Uh, there's a website for that, commercialmortgagebridgeloans.com. They're lending to the small businesses that we just said are having a hard time getting loans from traditional banks for commercial real estate projects or buying something or renovating or doing a deal of some kind over a short period of time. They, they, they take the money for a year. They're willing to pay a higher interest rate for a short period of time uh, because they know they're going to get a good small business loans. All the things tied to the prime rate have been, in fact, going up. Um, and you're seeing the impact. You're seeing car sales have been down six months in a row. Uh, retail sales have been weaker. Even home sales have been slower. And to some extent, that's because of a lack of inventory. Uh, but mortgage rates, you know, they're still up there to some extent. So I just think it's very odd that the Fed is raising rates when, when the economy is already slowing. In this flattening of the yield curve, where the short-term rates are going up and the long-term rates are going down is inevitably a bad, bad sign for the future economy, isn't it? When you get to an inverted yield curve, meaning short rates are higher than long-term rates, that is a clear sign that a recession is coming. Now, we're not there yet, but we're going that direction. Uh, as you said, the Fed raising rates uh, with a, what they control, which is what's called the Fed funds rate, is now one and a quarter, which means the prime is four and a quarter. So that's definitely been going up. But long-term rates, for the most part, have been coming down. The 10-year Treasury had gotten up to about 2.6 in February, and lately it's been about 2.1, 2.2, something in that range. Um, and that is telling you, the bond market's telling you things are weakening. Uh, you wouldn't have long rates coming down that much if the economy was strengthening. So that's the flattening of the yield curve. So there's some positive negatives. The positive of that is it's brought down mortgage rates to their lowest levels in over nine months now. Uh, the 30-year fixed rate mortgage, which not that long ago was almost 5%, a little bit over 5 is now down to 4 sometimes even a little bit below for 3.9 thereabouts. And the 15 year fixed, which not that long ago was over four, is now bound to three, maybe 2.9. So certainly for refinancing, uh, it makes sense. Again, if your current mortgage is 45 to 5% or higher, so it makes sense to take a look at refinancing. A website that can help you there is you can refi, y -O -U -Can -R -E -F -I .com. Um, And if you can switch from a 30-year to a 15-year at that lower rate, even though the payments may be a little bit higher, that would certainly be a good good move to make. Um, and I've, I've talked in your show before about the so-called mortgage optimization system or strategy, where you can pay off a 30-year mortgage in about five or six years uh, because you're using a home equity line of credit, which is tied at the lower rate, and you're making a lot more progress in your principal than you typically would. Uh, a website there, truthinequity.com. Uh, literally, you can pay off a 30-year mortgage about five or six years on your existing level of income if you have an open mind, I guess you might say. <laughs> yeah, well, you got to change your behavior to do that. You do. So, you do. yeah, well, the question is, do you pay off your mortgage or can you make more money uh, investing in something else that's not too off the wall, crazy risky. Right. So the, if you do something that's super conservative in the bank, it's not going to work because you're going to earn pretty much near zero. Uh, I mean, the, the bank is still paying, you know, pretty much zero or a little bit more than zero on CDs, savings accounts, money market funds. And I think that's going to stay that way, Kerry. I, I think the banks feel under no pressure whatsoever to raise what they're paying on deposits, even though they're very happy to raise what they're charging on loans. So their profit margin has widened. Um, and in fact, they just went through these stress tests. All top 34 banks passed with flying colors because they're making so much money. And as a result of that, the Fed said, raise your dividends and buy back stocks. So they were turning a huge amount of money to their shareholders. 
Uh, the dividends went up between 60 and 100 percent for the big banks, Citibank, mm -hmm. Wells Fargo, JP Morgan, things like that. And literally billions of dollars in stock buybacks that they were not able to do before. So the banks are doing really well and their shareholders are doing really well. Uh, but the poor depositors out there are, are suffering. Yeah. And, and, and people say, why aren't they raising what they're paying? It's, well, they can get away with it. So they do is basically yeah. what's happening. And they're not uh, they're not making loans to uh, needy businesses. So the idea of them buying back their stock is 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 madness and uh, and is harmful to the economy. I mean, it is. It's less capital to be lent. Yeah. I mean, here we are, eight nine years after the financial crisis, and it still have a very tight credit environment as far as I'm concerned, particularly on yeah. the small business loan side and the mortgage side. Even though rates are down for mortgages. The financial paperwork you have to go through to get a mortgage oh. and prove everything is just outrageous. It's, it's just maddening. ridiculous. It's maddening. Well, what this is going to lead to, and you know as well as I do, is increase in the size of the shadow banking system. Right. I mean, companies like SoFi and um, who is it? Uh, well, Prosper, Lending Club. There's Lending a whole Club. bunch of alternative of funders out there. That's great. Well, this uh, is going to be a boon to them. Uh, yeah. Because even if they keep their rates the same, they're still making an unbelievable spread. You know, I've been reading a book uh, by Mervyn King, who is the former governor of the Bank of England. Mm -hmm. And, you know, they can all tell the truth after they leave. That's they can't right. tell the truth when they're there. They got to lie their behinds off. And, you know, he talks about the whole flawed nature of banking in our civilization now. And that is that they borrow short term and they, lo they loan long long term. And so you can borrow cheaper short term. That means taking deposits for 25 basis points. And then they loan them out in the mortgage market, which is still pretty safe. Uh, they love to do subprime auto loans, not sub sub, right. and mortgages, which uh, have become much safer after the shakeout. In my opinion, it's probably the safest loan out there. FSN Radio. It's all about what's next. Go to FinancialSurvivalNetwork.com and sign up for your free weekly newsletter. You'll also get three free reports. The Financial Survival Network. It's all about what's next. Welcome. You are listening to the Financial Survival Network. I'm Kerry Lutz. It is July 5th, 2017. Well, there was once a presidency, and correct me if I'm wrong, I believe it was Warren Emil Harding, and it was supposed to be a return to normalcy. Well, the economy going on right now, the world in which we live in, nothing is normal anymore. And well, Jordan Goodman is with us now, moneyanswers.com. Hey, if you've got any questions, comments, email us at kl at kerrylutz.com. And Jordan, uh, hey, at least we're semi-normal on this show, right? I think we are. Maybe we're the only normal ones left, Carrie. Yes. I often think that that's the case, but then I'm wondering, is that a sign that you're not normal if you believe you're the only normal one? Is it catch-22? <laughs> Something like that. <laughs> no, it's a very unusual situation we have now because you've got the Fed Reserve raising short-term interest rates. They've raised them three times in the last six months, basically. They said they're going to raise them again this year, either September or December, and another three times next year. Uh, and they're shrinking their balance sheet. At least they said they are by $600 billion or so over the next year. So in effect, the Fed's tightening um, and the economy is getting slower. I think that's that's quite clear. And, and they're not doing it to slow the economy. They're doing it for so-called normalization purposes. Uh, but you're seeing the impact on that. I mean, people are paying more for credit cards, student loans, car loans,